cultural transformation, it takes time, and it's, and it's not easy. It is difficult, but it is possible with God's grace. Um, I said that culture is shaped by values. And uh, in the book, I talk about 10 values. And I'd like to go through them fairly quickly uh, because values are foundational to culture. And I really believe that if you live the right values, your church will become healthy. Now, I've got a slide up here that says Sepphoris. When I go to the Holy Land, I love going to Sepphoris. It was the, uh, the um, capital of, of Galilee at the time of Jesus. It had suffered an earthquake um, uh, a number of decades before. And so at the time of Jesus, it was, um, it was still being rebuilt. It's only four kilometers from Nazareth. And you know, it says in Scripture that Jesus was a, a the word is tecton which we translate carpenter, you know, carpenter. Remember, you see the holy card images of Jesus with a little saw, a little hammer, hammering nails. The tecton really means construction worker. He was a construction worker. And the thing I love about Sepphoris, not many people go there, but there's foundations of buildings and roadworks that were rebuilt at the time of Jesus during his hidden years when he was a construction worker. This is like four kilometers from his house. So I imagine, I get no proof, but I imagine that Jesus laid some of these stones. <laughs> and that when we walk there, we're walking. We're, I know, Jesus, I mean, unless he just sat in his room for 30 years, he, he would have walked on these roads. I love it. It's beautiful. And I, you see the foundations of the buildings. And, and I think of what, I mean, even Jesus in his parable, he talked about building a foundation on sand and building it on rock. He was a construction worker. He knew what he was talking about. And values are like the foundations of the house you're going to build, this renovated house of God, is built on values. And there are 10 values that I want to go through quickly with you. Now, the book, about 40% of the book is on these 10 values, and I really apologize about making it one chapter. I got some feedback about that. <laughs> like, why? what is this chapter going to end? It's like 100 pages, one chapter. Um, but it's broken up into 10 sections, so... The 10 values, uh, number one, priority to the weekend. I remember years ago <laughs> realizing this. It was like a, dumb, a totally dumb moment uh, that you know, 90% of the time when I see 90% of my people is on Sunday morning, yet in my ministry, Sunday was getting leftovers. When I had very little energy left, I'd start thinking about Sunday. It was like kind of like forever spare change throughout Sunday as opposed to the real work of ministry. You know, one-on-one -on -one counseling with 1% of my parishioners, the most neediest people who will never be satisfied. You know, doing Bible studies for 2% of my parishioners, and they, all of that energy goes into, like 90% of your energy goes into that, and you get like 10% left for when you get everyone in church. What if we flip that around to give priority to the weekend? Um, and... That means hospitality, to develop hospitality. Remember, belong, believe, behave. And hospitality isn't just about people standing at the door saying, good morning, good morning, good morning. It means every range of hospitality, uh, of, of the building layout, and the, the, what does the foyer look like, and, and sensitivity to, to people who don't go to church, and, and a, a clear place for them to connect, and even recognizing that there may be people who are new or visiting or, 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 or new in church, being even in our preaching as priests, being sensitive to not using all this flowery theological language. You know, like, I don't care how many big words you use, says the guy who said a few big words here today. But anyway, uh, but you know what I mean? Like, it's like, in the first reading, we talk about the Paschal mystery, and it's like, what is Paschal mystery? What does that mean? Is that a mystery novel? You know, murder she wrote? I don't know. Like, it's, you know what I mean? Like, we gotta be, we, we don't know how churchy we are. So, hospitality, it has to do with, you know, smiling. Uh, I talk about pew hospitality, you know, people who hog the outside of the pew and scowl at you if you even suggest that they move. You gotta, like, climb over them. Uh, there's, there's so many things uh, that you can do. At our, at our parish, really, uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, you know, I'll often be at the front door for weekend masses, and, and then you go about six feet, and there's other people welcoming you. And then there's a hospitality welcome booth over here for new people to connect. And at the doors of the, of the, of the sanctuary, there are people on both sides welcoming you, and you come in, there's people welcoming you. And 
And especially the nine o'clock mass, if you're, if you're not a familiar face, as soon as you sit down, you're going to have about 10 people welcoming you, saying, welcome, where are you from? Welcome to the parish. And uh, people often, we, we, we don't see it anymore. We're kind of blind to it because it's become our culture. But people come and they're like, wow, this is amazing. Um, next is uplifting music. Mm, did I hear groans out there? You know, when I first arrived at St. Benedict Parish, the music was eh, not so good. Um, we have a couple of values with music. Number one, diversity versus uniformity of music. Quality and priority to the hymn of praise. Let me say something about each of these. Diversity. There's a lot of debate about this. And it has to do with the tension between that missionary identity and, and, and the fact that we've got to touch the culture we're in, be relevant to the culture. But as Catholics especially, we're, we're, we, we're a broad church, not just geographically and culturally, but across time. And we, we, are, in, we are inheritors of a past tradition. It's what Jesus says, the wise steward brings out of his storehouse both those things that are new and old. It's a mixture. And I'm always suspicious of someone who says, the, it's only good if it's new, or it's only good if it's bad. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I just said that to see if you were awake. <laughs> it's only good if it's old, or it's, only, it's bad if it's old, or it's, or it's bad if it's good. You see these, these attitudes. And so we have a diversity of music. And so let me tell you quickly what we have. And what we have now developed over six years. We didn't, we didn't have this six years ago. At our Saturday Mass, which tends to have a lot of you know, seniors, we just have a simple uh, cantor, a good you know, trained person with a trained voice, a cantor with either piano or organ. And we generally sing kind of, kind of safe kind of hymns you know, from, the, from, the, from the hymn book. At the 9 a.m. Mass, we have a band, uh, con even saying contemporary worship, band, contemporary band, it doesn't really work, but it's, we use like music like Matt Marr and things like that. And when you come in, it's, we live stream that Mass, if any of you ever watched on live stream. So there's bass guitar, electric guitar, acoustic guitar, drums, keyboard, and it's professionally mixed, and it's a blast. We rock the place, and it's, and it's, it's appropriate music. The, it, we take great care to pick stuff that's theologically sound, that's musically sound, and is proper and fitting for the Eucharist. There's a lot of contemporary music that is not fitting for the Eucharist, but it, it really is, and it is, I love it. It's beautiful, man. And, and the place kind of, it kind of rocks. Like people, people dance and some people, we say, feel free, pray with your bodies, put your hands up if you want. At the end of mass, we bring the kids up, the kids all dance and, and there's energy and, and, and it's beautiful, it's moving. And guitar solos, it's great, seriously, it's wonderful. Very appropriate and tasteful. Um, and then in 1115, we have choral music. Latin mass parts, Gregorian chant, sacred polyphony, incense. Um, and I love that too. I feel like I'm walking into the Holy of Holies. I feel that way with the nine o'clock mass too. So, and, and Sunday night mass, we have a contemporary choir that do a lot of the same contemporary music as the band does, but it's, but it's choir and piano. And it has a unique sound and it's very well done as well. And, and it's diverse. And I think diversity is a Catholic value, uh, not uniformity. So that's diversity, number one. Number two, quality. We have this thing in, as Catholics sometimes, it's, it's like, you know, we're Catholics. We, we have the Eucharist. We have the sacraments. So we don't have to have good music. <laughs> we have the sacraments, so we don't have to have good preaching. We have the sacraments, so it's okay if Mass is boring and irrelevant to most people, because it's not boring and irrelevant to me, because I have a very deep and profound faith, and I know Jesus is there, and that's good enough for me. And shame on those terribly shallow people who can't connect with the mystery of the, of the Eucharist the way I do. I don't know if that, you have people like that in here. <laughs> you guys are great. This is the funnest talk so far. Let me say this is good. Uh, so what was I talking about? Uh, <laughs> quality, quality, yeah. Uh, we have this thing sometimes that, you know, that's very worldly, Father, to talk about, to think that quality is important. That's worldly. You know, there's the passage in Scripture about the building of the temple in the Old Testament and how, you know, God gave gifts of skill 
and to play with all your skill. Like we owe it to God's. If, if someone was on a stage at a, at a secular thing, you'd, you'd darn right you'd do your best to be the best quality. We're praising God. We, we, we've got to strive for excellence and beauty and transcendence. And that means if you're a choir director and your choir doesn't want to show up for, for, for rehearsal, fire the lot of them and start over again. There's too much at stake. And we did that. We, we sacked the choir because they didn't want to practice. That's why on Saturday we only have a cantor and, a, and an organ. We fired them. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a true story. We gave them the option. We said, we got this amount of money in the budget for this. We'll have a choir director. I'm not gonna have a choir director. Actually, the, the choir, the music people did this. I didn't have to do this. The music people said, you know, we're not gonna pay for a director if you don't wanna come and practice. We'll disband the choir and we'll use this money to, to pay cantors to give them a stipend so we have good quality. Anyway, so uh, practice and striving to be better. We have an annual music conference that we do at our parish called Exalt, it's the third time. We've done it th three years in a row to invest in our musicians so that we have the best quality music, not just technically, but spiritually. We want our musicians to grow spiritually and to pray and not just be functionaries. We've got to, th there should be a sensitivity to quality. Quality speaks to people. You know, I will say this, there's a, a, a a relationship between quality and church size. I talk in the book about, um, about church size dynamics in the final chapter, a very important one. We're often uh, blind to that. But if you're in a little tiny small, small church in the country, you're thinking, get out of here. I can't do it. I can't have a band. I can't do that stuff. I don't even have enough. I've only got six people in my church. <laughs> Here's the thing. If a church is small enough, it, it's, it's much more relational, right? Uh, Beyond 50 people, relationships start breaking down. But if you're, you get a small group of people, because there is an investment in relationships, people don't worry so much about quality. If Mrs. Smith, who's been playing the organ for 40 years, is up there and she's like half blind and, and making, people don't care that much. You know why? Because they know her and they love her. And people will forgive that. But if you're in a big church, where people don't know each other and they're anonymous, you've got to seek quality music because people are not going to be forgiving because they don't know Mrs. Smith. Third thing around music was priority to the hymn of praise. When I first went to St. Benedict Parish, it was the massive dedication, and I remember noticing that every single hymn in the liturgy, we did not talk to God. Not once did we address our sung prayer to God. We were talking to each other. Let's dance in the forest and play in the fields and let's do this and let's do this and let's go do this and let's go for a beer. And, and, and it was like talking to ourselves. And you know something? If the Psalms are our model, that's okay. The, the Psalms actually have um, exhortation. Psalms of exhortation. Let us go up to the house of the Lord. Let us do this. Let us rejoice. So that's perfectly fitting to have hymns of exhortation or hymns of confession, but that means professing that God is great, God is great, God. But when you sing God is great, God is great, God is great, you're not talking to God, you're, you're telling each other God is great, right? God is great, God is great. And God's like, hey, when are you guys going to talk to me? Uh, or we can sing hymns of petition to God when we finally do get, ever get around to talking to God. Uh, hey, God, you know, bring peace to the earth. Can you do this first? Can you do that? Can you do that? And all of that is good and proper because it's in the Psalms. It's there. They're not bad. The most beautiful psalms are the Hallel psalms, the, the psalms of praise where God is being praised. And I believe that when we enter into hymns of praise of God, something in here happens. That uh, praise, what, what did we sing in our opening hymn at morning prayer? O oh, creatures of a king. That, what's the high point of that hymn? Hallelujah. Because that's good, both, right? We're, you're all creatures of your God and King. You're, you're saying, all creatures, let's praise God, let's praise God. And then now with the refrain, all right, let's all praise God. And that's the most favorite part of the, of the hymn because now we're praising God. Now we're actually turning to God. You know, St. Augustine said, if you sing, you pray twice. How can you pray twice if you're not even praying once? So priority to the hymn of praise. It doesn't mean that you, you can only do hymns of praise, no, but give it priority. I don't know how tired I've gotten, especially communion time. 
Eat the bread, drink the cup, 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 let's eat the bread, drink the cup, eat the bread, drink the cup, eat the bread, let's sing it again, eat the bread, drink the cup. <sighs> it's Jesus, isn't it? Can we talk to the guy? Like, let's sing. I remember talking to a musician, they were like, we, we can't do that. We've got to sing about eating the bread and drinking the cup. <laughs> And being one body, and, and the, the idea of you actually singing a hymn at communion time when you're actually talking to Jesus was like, what? That's <laughs> crazy. But you know something? When you actually sing to Jesus at communion time, people have conversions. People, I see it every week at St. Benedict Parish. Tears pouring down people's faces. There's nothing wrong with God. There's nothing wrong with the Holy Spirit. When we sing hymns of praise in a diverse form, um, I've seen... Uh, him, tears in people's eyes when a choral piece is being sung as well. Like it's like priority to the hymn of praise because that's when stuff happens. All right, how you doing so far? <laughs> Homilies. Pope Francis said in Evangelii Gaudium, I think it's one of the first like official magisterial papal jokes uh, that uh, most priests suffer from having to prepare homilies and most Catholics suffer from having to listen to them. <laughs> What a travesty that somehow we have been able to bore people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, so I believe that um, a lot more work has to go into our homilies. One of the problems is, is that I had a homiletics course in, in the seminary, and I was formed in the seminary, of course, in a, a hyper-academic environment. And your preaching training, when we were deacons, we were like, we took turns. And I remember preaching as a deacon at the seminary. You're really nervous. Well, all your theology press professors are sitting there, and all the seminarians, and if, any seminaries here, you, or priests remember, it's like, it's like hyper, we're like at a different plane with theological sensitivity. So you, you preach theology. You even talk about exegesis and blah, blah, blah. I like to say those things are like your underwear. You should have them, but don't show it off. <laughs> um, people don't care about this, the sits and leave, and they think that's like spots on your face or something. I don't know. Like, we need to do our work, we need to do our research, we need to be sound in that, but, but what are we about? What are we trying to achieve in preaching? I had a, an older priest with me uh, as an associate a couple of years ago. He was a man who, he had, his wife had died and he was ordained. He was a so relatively newly ordained priest, but an older man. And I remember saying to him, Michael, when you preach, who do you, who do you imagine you're speaking to? And he described himself, and fair enough. He described, uh, a 68-year-old, lifelong, believing Catholic. I said, do you know something? I said, when I preach, you know the image that comes to me, and I'm just sharing this, is I feel like I'm on the ground and the, uh, there's a burning building and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get people to, to jump to safety. That's the overwhelming sense I have when I preach. Um, Preaching is, one of our problems is that as pastors, we're so overwhelmed, we're so busy. Uh, again, the, we don't get to, we don't have time to get to it, and we're, we're, we're writing our homilies in the back of an envelope in the confessional before Mass sometimes. I've done it. I've done it. Sometimes I can get away with it because I, I, I thanks be to God, in all humility, I've, I've got a, a bit of a communication gift. I mean, I can, I can get up there unprepared and probably do a bit better than some guys do. do. But that, that is no excuse. That is no excuse at all. We owe it to, to really, really prepare well. And I really believe that, that preaching, um, I think I said, you know, I believe it's, it's, fa it's not fast food. Uh, so homilies in our parish are between 15 and 20 minutes long. Because I want to feed the hungry. If you're not hungry, come, come to Alpha. And hopefully you get hungry. And if, and if, if our homies are driving you crazy, there is saying elsewhere is down the road, as certain people keep reminding me. And it's the, there's the door. Like, honestly, honestly. I'm not worried about that. Um, but you all know that, I mean, I've sat through five minutes homies that felt like an hour long. So it's, 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 the issue is not the time. So what do we do? We, we say, I asked three questions of our preaching team. I have an associate pastor. Uh, I did have an interim priest at one point, and I used to have two deacons. We were, numbers are different, but we had, we call a preaching team. And when it's your turn to preach, whoever preaches, preaches all the weekend masses. 
I know that drives some liturgists crazy, but we've got to live in the real world. Because the homily, if you want to lead transformation in your parish as a pastor, your homily is your single greatest tool to preach vision about where are we going? What's it all about? Why do we do what we're doing? Why are we thinking about not doing what we're doing? Why are we, why are we going to do this? Why, why, why? And, and if you're going to lead the parish, if you, if you don't want to lead the parish anywhere, you don't have to do any of this. I like to say to preach, you know, like, if you just want to maintain things, don't need, you don't need to do this stuff. If you're happy uh, uh, managing the decline of your church, you don't need to do this stuff. Your church will be dead soon enough. <laughs> it's true. And I'll just say this. Like, you guys are in much better shape than we are in Canada. And Canada is it's desperate. My diocese is, is in the brink of total collapse. Like, it's so bad. Like, this, we've got, in the last 20, what I see in the church in Australia is like what Canada was like 25 years ago. And things have gone, <laughs> church attendance, everything. Uh, you, guys, you, guys are, 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 you guys are doing relatively well. And the fact that you're grappling now with these issues is amazing. It's amazing. The reason for hope, okay? But we're in a, a desperate situation. So we've got to move the thing. And the homily is the greatest tool to move. Every three weeks, I preach a visioning homily. I always have. And when I say visioning homily, I, I, I don't just mean vision is about where we're going. I talk about that all the time. But anytime I want to talk about where are we going and why are we doing what we're doing or we're going to make a change, it's a visioning homily. And we also do preaching series. You can go on our, our website and go to the live stream link. And all of our homilies for the last two years are up there in video. And we do HD video streaming if you want to check so, some of those out. And some of them, we've got you know, examples of visioning homilies in our preaching series, which we prepare in advance. And, uh, and we, we, we follow the lectionary. We don't ignore the lectionary. So it takes a lot of work, sometimes a little bit of acrobatics. But we, we're at least focusing on one of the readings. And what do I ask our preaching team before they preach? I said, I want you to answer three questions. What do you want people to know? What do you want them to do? And why does it matter? If you can't answer that question, you don't know what you're talking about. And why should anyone listen to you? If you can't answer in one sentence the core message of your homily, what do you want people to know? I remember with uh, one of our deacons, uh, when I, he first was ordained and started this stuff, I asked him to send it to me. And under what do I want people to know, he sent me a paragraph of all this theological stuff. And then what do I want people to do? Uh, I, I, I want them to know this. He gave me an, a, another section of what he wanted people to know under the section about what he wanted people to do. He didn't want people to do anything. He just wanted them to know stuff and know stuff and know stuff and know stuff. But, you know, if you, if you communicate too much stuff, it's, it's just overwhelming. I mean, it doesn't mean that you just have to repeat the same phrase the whole time. But at some point, the homily is, is coming down to one thing. What do you want them to know? And what do you want them to do about it? What's the ask? What's the ask? Like, so what? I've heard so many homilies. There are just this, this, this reflection that, that is no actual ask, no, no application to my life. Give me something to, to chew on. Give me something. Throw me a bone here. And why does it matter? Like, like, tell me why. Convince me that it's important. OK? So those are three questions. We also, the other thing we also say is there's got to be the kerygma has got to be articulated in every single homily. In every homily, the, the core message, and there's manifest different ways to which to, co to communicate the kerygma. So many ways, but it's got to be in there. This message of God's love and salvation and grace through Jesus Christ and, and that, that God loves us and he's merciful and we don't have to be defined by our past and God forgives sins and the new life and all the wonderful... And even if you're preaching a difficult message, it's got to feel like good news. It's got to feel like it. I mean, how many times have we heard a homily and it's like, man, I'm so depressed. <laughs> and here's another thing, uh, laughter. You got to, I believe, you got to make people laugh. Our, how I'm presenting here is how I preach. I, I stand in, in, in front of the altar. I know that some people don't like that. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> I stand in front of the altar. I preach from the, the pulpit at funerals and, and weekday mass. But on Sunday, again, I know I've got people. There's some people out there who don't even know why they're coming. Some people don't even believe in Jesus. We have a lot of guests and visitors. It's, it's this desire to reach them. And we have slides, uh, screens in both sides of the sanctuary. And, and I, exactly how I'm 
talking to you is how I preach. And the audiovisual thing is, is phenomenal. Because we're visual learners. People are like, that's terrible. We should be using hymn books. <laughs> yeah, when did, did they have did Jesus at hymn books at the Last Supper? <laughs> or what do you call a, you know, these big screens? What do you call a stained glass window? <laughs> it's a big screen. Uh, I remember, uh, I forget, I think it was in a church in Rome, and they had one of these old psalters that they used to use in the, in the monastic um, choir. <laughs> big book this big. They open it up. Shh, you know, like the, the notes are, are like this big. It's a big screen for people to sing from. And, and so it's, it engages people. And, and it has to be uh, aesthetically pleasing. I've seen some terrible examples of it. And it should, it should blend in with the liturgy. It shouldn't stand out. But keep your slides simple and clean. Single images, not a lot of words, like this one has. <laughs> um, and ju laughter, laughter. Something biochemically happens when people laugh. Now, I'm just not, ta I'm not talking about you know, throwing in the joke of the day that has no bearing. But you know, life is funny. Life is really funny. I, find, I think the Gospels are hilarious. Uh, there's so much. <laughs> They're hilarious, you know? Like, you know the one about... Um, when Jesus goes to the, the, when he's on the rant, it was, I think, about a month ago about, you know, what are you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, and all this, and the lawyer goes like, uh, Master, when you, when you speak like that, you, you, you insult us too. It's like, no, don't do it. Don't do it. It's like the guy in the horror movie who says, oh, I heard a noise in the basement. I think I'll go and investigate. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, hilarious. That Jesus is like, oh, you want some too? And, or, um, <laughs> you know, uh, Shepherd has 100 sheep and one goes missing, uh, which who wouldn't leave the 99 and go in search of the one? People are like, are you crazy? <laughs> you think I'm an idiot? I'd let the one starve. I don't care about that. I'm not losing my life saving. I mean, Jesus knew that was hilarious. Or the, the, the splinter, you see splinter in someone's eye and you don't see the log. That's hilarious. Someone walking around with a log sticking out of their eye. It's hilarious. Like it's, the gospel is funny. Jesus had a great sense of humor. Life is funny. Life is really, really funny. Um, and when people laugh, the, this, the, the Lord can work through that. It really can. And, uh, and if you're not naturally funny, ask, ask, ask for help. You know, people... <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Even not being funny is funny, you know? It's, <laughs> so I have people laugh. And here's the thing. Two, two more points about preaching. Start with a hook. You're opening for literally for God's sake. Don't start your homily. In today's reading, the first reading, it's like <laughs> right away. Like it's so boring. Like, like say something that's gonna make me want to listen to the rest of what you have to say. Like, like give me, give start a story right off the ask a provocative question, make a crazy statement. Like do something. Um, uh, you do the hook. You got me in. Now I'm going to listen to you. And finally, at the end of the homily, land the, can I say damn? Yeah. Land the damn plane, will you? Have you ever had the, you listen to a homily, you're thinking, when is this going to be over? Man, man. And you're just like, oh, it's, he's coming to the close. It's coming to the close. It's going to finish. Because he said, and finally. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, well, we're, we're get, now we're into the appendix now, you know? It's like, a couple of years ago, I was coming back from Florida. <laughs> And uh, I was on a plane, and I was coming back on vacation, and I had to, it was First Communion, and I was, and it was a blizzard. I, did, I was supposed to come home the night before. It's that thing with snow I was telling you about. And we had to stay overnight in Montreal, and I had First Communion the next day, and I was panicking. And, uh, and so I, I had to make a little video to say hi to the kids, because I wasn't going to be there. But I wanted to be there for 11.15 Mass, and we were flying in over Halifax, and it was really windy, and the plane was coming down to land, and it was just about to touch him, but all of a sudden the engines went and the plane took off again. And I thought, this is like some homilies I've heard. <laughs> like, land the plane. Land the plane. All right, so, that, so that's preaching. Um, meaningful community. Jesus says, they will know you are my disciples by your fancy buildings, <laughs> by your catechetical programs, by your schools, 
They will know you are my disciples when you have love for one another. Uh, Tertullian tells us, one of the early writers, early theologians in the church, that the, the pagans used to look at the Christians and say, they love each other. See how they love each other? That's what was so attractive. They love each other. Community is about love, not socializing. Not socializing. We have a lot of socializing in church, but it's not, is it authentic Christian community? I define Christian community as this, where people are known by others and know others, and they're accountable to and for one another. And so many of our churches, we were asking, am I my brother's keeper? Really? Seriously? Come on, give me a break. You know, I used to travel around with, uh, I gave a homily in my first year at the parish where I talked about Cheers. Did you get the TV show Cheers? You know, remember the theme song? You want to go where everyone knows your name and they're glad you came and blah, blah, blah. And I actually put the words up. And a week later, somebody gave me this little plastic thingy where you push the button and it sings the, the, the Cheers song. And when I think about that, it's so true. We, that we, we want to go to a place where we're known, where people know our name, where they're glad we came, we, we came. But look at the body language in church sometimes. It's like, I don't want to know your name, and I don't care whether you came or not. Get out of my way. Uh, when my first two weeks at St. Benedict Parish, at this, especially at the Saturday Mass, I had the shock in my life. I'm giving out communion, and the back of this beautiful church is a, just a glass wall into the foyer, and I look up, and there's about 200 people leaving church in the foyer. I, I was shocked. Now remember that many of these people had come from a smaller church where they'd go to a Saturday Mass with 60 people. Now there were 600 people. Mass takes a little longer. You just giving out communion takes longer, and they're like, Oof, I'm out of here. And they're, they were leaving in droves, so I had to address it. I addressed it gently and firmly. <laughs> I did. And I got complaints and letters and nasty things. People, someone wrote a letter to the bishop, someone wrote a letter to the pope. <laughs> so like, it was pretty nasty stuff. Um, but now, uh, six years later, there's maybe like three people leave, and they're all visitors. So, and it just happened, you know, be, um, but what is the body language of that, right? It's like, I got my, I got my thing, now I'm gone. Um, in the first month in the new parish, I remember one day after Mass, Saturday Mass, I was processing out the closing hymn, and I was overtaken by people leaving. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a little old lady with a cane, she's like, So I tripped her. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. <laughs> but it's like someone shouted, someone pulled the fire alarm, right? Fire! <laughs> it's like, what does the body language say? It's like, let's get the hell out of here. Like, I just can't, I can't stand this any longer. Like, it's over, good. It's like a prize, like there's a prize to get to the parking lot first. Like, what does that say? It's like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be with these people. I'm putting up with these people so I can get my thing, so I can get into heaven when I die. <laughs> get what I want for the least, the least lowest price for the least amount of, in, of inconvenience. Contrast that to what happens when people encounter Jesus and the experience profound community of, of actually opening your heart and actually beginning to love the people around you and care and come to know and, and, and take responsibility for one another. It's not just Father's responsibility. We're going to be responsible for one another. And we have now what we have at the 9 o'clock Mass. I've got I to I gotta like call the police to get people to leave. And <laughs> um, in, in, in what happens in, in, the, in our connect groups. It's beautiful. And that's the wonderful thing about the connect groups. I can tell you what happens functionally the night they gather, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is what happens during the week when someone gets ill or someone passes away. We had a man called Wayne, and he hadn't been to church in 30 years from a non-Catholic background. His wife was a parishioner, and he came to church a few times, and somehow she managed to talk him into taking Alpha, and he took Alpha and had a powerful experience of God's love. We even had, actually had him give a testimony at all the masses after the homily, and he wasn't even Catholic. He was up there telling people about Jesus, and you know, and you know, the 15% of grumpy people who don't like what I'm doing are sitting there, mm, these alpha people. And it's very threatening to them because here's a guy who wasn't going to church for 30 years standing up there talking about something that I think the reason they're so resistant is because they're like, I don't know what he's talking about. 
I don't, I, and it's scary. It's scary, you know. Um, but Wayne uh, involved in stuff, and about a year later, he came up to me. I said, Father, I think it's time. I talked to my wife. He said, yeah. he said it's time to become Catholic. I said, great. We've actually got like tons of non-Catholic parishioners now. See, when you become missionary, those old lines, no one cares about that stuff, in Canada anyway. So we get people who are parishioners, they're involved in ministry, you know, they don't come to the sacraments yet. They're always saying, when you're ready, let us know. But they're involved in the life of the church. And so I said, Wayne said, so what do I have to do? I said, well, I know you've taken Alpha, because you gave a testimony. He said, yeah. And he said, I'm actually on the Alpha team right now. I said, great. I said, well, the next thing we want you to do is to join a connect group. He said, I'm already in a connect group. I said, great. He said, well, we have a catechetical program called Catholicism 2.1. He said, I took it last year. And I'm helping run the one right now. I was like, great, OK. Well, uh, show up for three meetings, and we'll do you at the Easter Vigil. <laughs> you know, like, and we did. And he was serving in the Knights of Columbus, a refugee committee, St. Vincent de Paul. This guy is in doctor's offices telling people about Jesus, you know, offering to pray for people. Uh, he, was a, he was a sailor, lifelong sailor. Didn't go to church for 30 years. And four months ago, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. I miss him, you know. I went to see him two weeks ago. Had his funeral last week. Had his funeral on Tuesday last week. And um, in his retirement, he wanted to go to the Bahamas. He built a boat. And he wanted to go to the Bahamas. And he said, Father James, I don't regret not going to the Bahamas. This was two days before he died. He said, I just regret that I'm not going to be able to serve the Lord at St. Benedict. Um, do you know, he told me in his first day in the hospital, 50 people visited him. Oh. Says the hospital staff, were thinking, who is this guy, you know? Is he a movie star that we don't know about? We didn't organize it. We didn't put it in the bulletin. We didn't, didn't come through central office, go visit Wayne. He's sick. It's organic. It's community. And it's beautiful. And his funeral was packed with people from Connect Group and Alpha. It was such a celebration of faith. It was such a testament. You know, people come up afterwards and say, maybe I should come back to church. Of course, they, most of the time they don't. But anyway, that's, uh, funerals can be evangelistic, but uh, you've got to do more than that. Anyway, I tell you that story just because of meaningful community. And also, it demonstrates the fact that it's something we've, we've worked for, that the, the program is the life of the church, right? He did the program without even knowing he did the program because our culture has changed so much that it's just what you do around this place. OK, clear expectations. Now, this is an interesting one, clear expectations. Clear expectations, we're very afraid of this one. When I first went to St. Benedict, there was actually fairly good hospitality in terms of good morning, good morning, good morning, have a bulletin. Uh, and we, we sang all, all are welcome. The, the, the Wi-Fi guest password is all are welcome. And we sang all the time, all are welcome, all are, you know that hymn? Yeah. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome to this place, to this place, in this place, to this place, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome. And that's great. But is that all we're doing, welcoming people to a place? I mean, all are welcome. And that's what I love about our parish. It's like a big funnel, a big wide funnel. We, we say, we don't care how messy your life is, Catholic, non-Catholic, atheist, agnostic. We don't care. Come, 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 come. You're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. And we, you are welcome. But welcome to what? Welcome to what? To just the building? Or welcome to a wonderful process of discovering Jesus Christ and his love and and growing as a disciple, and I don't care if that takes you 20 years. It's not how fast you're moving or what point of the journey you're on, but whether you're on the journey or not, whether you want to be on the journey, versus the consumer Catholics who come de noisily demanding things, who have absolutely no interest whatsoever in being on any journey. I don't want your journey. I just want my kid baptized. Forget it. I mean, we invite them. We, invite, we never say no. But we might say not yet. And people don't like that. And then they go to St. Elsewhere. And that's fine, because they can go to that church and not go to it. So versus coming to my church and not going to it. Like, if we only get so much energy. If we only get so much energy, what are we going to invest in? 
pouring energy into people who want apples when we're trying to say, no, no, you really want an orange, okay? You really want, people are like, yeah, 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 whatever. Okay, I want an orange, I want an apple. Uh, what, what hoops do I have to jump through? It's contractual, right? And we never see them again, right? And we put all of this energy, energy into it. Uh, but if you put the energy into evangelizing adults, it's great, okay. And then, and then you've got another problem because you've got all these people who have awakened spiritually and actually want to be on the journey and want sacraments. And some of them, many of them have very messy lives. And you gotta, meet, you gotta be there with them and love them and walk with them. I tell you, if you like, if you like um, order and neatness, this might not be for you. <laughs> it's just kind of like parenting, right? Because that's what it is. We've, we've got tons of immature believers, but they're believers, they're, they're reborn. And they're messy, just like there's, there's sorry, there's, there's spiritual nappies that need to be changed. There's, there's blood, vomit, and everything else coming out all over the place. It's just like parents. You know it, right? That being parents is not for the squeamish. Uh, and it's the same spiritually, yeah? Uh, and some Catholics are like, no, I don't. And we've had this problem. It's like, well, I'd rather just like hang out with mature Catholics like me. <laughs> And I've had this problem with some of the even good Catholics who have been honestly involved in, in renewal movements and evangelistic movements. It's, it's a strange thing how unmissionary these missionary people are. It's like, no, Father, I just want to hang out with people like me, and maybe you can come once a week and hear our confessions and do Eucharistic adoration for us. It's like, no, I can't. We've got these things called connect groups. Yeah, but there's, there's messy people in there. There's messy. There's people who don't, not sure if they believe in God. There's, uh, I could tell you stories. <laughs> it's, it's, it, but remember, belong, believe, behave. How are we going to bring people to belief and behavior if we don't provide places for them to belong? If people come to Alpha and they're invited by friends and they're not church goers and they have messy lives and they have an, an encounter with Jesus and they say, I want to move forward, they're not ready. They might not even be ready to come start coming to Mass, but let's get them into a connect group and let's love them. Okay, so clear expectations. So welcome to what? This is the process we're welcoming people to. But think about four possibilities of expectation versus the value of hospitality because hospitality is a value as well. Think of a grid with four boxes, right? One possibility is low hospitality, low expectation. And sadly, this, this, this describes a lot of our parishes. The hospitality is very poor. Uh, I, I sometimes like going into churches incognito just to see what I experience. And it's, sometimes it's, it's awful. It really is. Um, and also low expectation. We don't really expect anything of you at all. Um, so that's not so good. And then another possibility is low welcome, high expectation, which is kind of like we don't like you, but we want your money. <laughs> we don't really like that you're coming here, but uh, we need someone to teach catechism, so you'll do. It's like we, we want to use you. We don't like you, but we'll use you. That's awful. But how often does that happen? Rick Warren says, don't use people to build up your church. Use your church to build up people. Pope Francis in Evangelii Gaudium said, you know that famous quote, I dream of a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything. And he lists all the customs and everything that should be transformed. He said, for the sake of mission, not merely out of a sense of self-preservation. If you're here today, no, I won't put it like that. Sometimes our motivation to we better start evangelizing, because if we don't, we're not going to be here. That's selfish. That's like, OK, we better go find people, because uh, otherwise the thing I really like won't be here anymore. Evangelization is going to be rooted in love. It's the, like the heart of the Father. It goes back to the Titanic. You know, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Do we weep over the people who are not there, the people who are far from God, the people who haven't made their way back to the Father? Does it even bother us? You know? So, uh, we don't want to use people. So another option is high welcome, low expectations. And that's what was happening in my parish when I got there. And when I started talking about expectations, the people in the hospitality ministry were like, oh, I don't know about that. You're going to turn people away. You can't, you can't talk like that. You can't say to people that you expect something. But think about that for a second. It's like, you're so welcome, Kayleen. You, we, we love the, so you're so welcome here. You're welcome, welcome, but we don't expect anything from you at all. We, we don't ex we actually, we don't expect God to do anything in your life. We don't, we, actually, we don't expect God to use you at all. Um, no, nope, we expect nothing from you. But you're, 
<laughs> but you're welcome. You're welcome. But we don't expect. But here's the crazy thing. Why? Shouldn't we expect that, welcome, you're going to love it here. It, it's amazing because you're, you're going to grow. I know you, we, we expect you to grow because health, you know, that's what God wants. And you, you're, going to, you're going to enjoy serving God and you're going to experience being used by God. It's, it's amazing. And so we do expect it. And when we do, that's the, per, the thing we want to aim for, high hospitality, high expectation. It's what Jesus did, right? Jesus welcomed the poor, the sinners, everyone, high hospitality. But then he said, leave your possessions, come follow me. He said to the rich young man, and I, love, I don't know which synoptic gospel it is, but looking at him, he loved him and said, go sell your possessions and come follow me. Ooh. And the guy walks away. It's a mystery to me that Jesus let him walk away. I would have been like, okay, 80%, <laughs> 70, 75, 74, okay, deal. Um, we don't know what happened to that rich young man. Think in terms of expectation. Think of the parable of the, t of the talents, right? I don't remember talents as a unit of weight. It's silver and gold. Uh, the guy that buried his in the ground, like he, got, he thought he was going to be okay, right? The master's like, take his and give it to him. The, the master expects a return on the investment. To those who have been given much, much will be... <laughs> I am the vine, you are the branches. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit will be taken and thrown in the fire. Every branch that bears fruit will be pruned. Why? So that it may bear more fruit. The Lord has expectations. I, I think of the, the, the story of the, of the fig tree. Have you ever read that one of the gospel? Jesus is like walking by the fig tree. He's hungry and, he, and he's like, hey, there's no figs. Curse the tree. You ever read that one? You ever see the little line in there that says, it was not the season for figs? <laughs> Like, come on! Like, what's, give, give the tree a break, right? Like, what's, what's with that? That was very, isn't it weird when Jesus is very un Jesus like? This doesn't sound like Jesus. Not my Jesus. What's going on here? What's, what's, why is Jesus cursing this tree? It's not the season for figs. Well, of course, if you read Psalm 1 and the Ezekiel 47, the story of the water flowing from the temple, these two scriptures have in common that where the water flowed, Everything came to life. And the fruit-bearing trees bear fruit in season and out of season. Where was Jesus going, coming from when he walked past the fig tree? The temple. He's flowing from the temple. Jesus says, if those who believe in me, rivers of life will flow abundantly from their hearts. He, lo he wants fruit in season and out of season. The Lord has expectations of us, and we shouldn't be shy, shy about it. Even if people say, you know something? Not for me. So what we do, how do we manage this tension between high welcome and high hospitality? I've got to be honest with you, we've not always, sometimes we've messed it up. Sometimes, it's like parenting, right? You've got, when do you, when do you discipline, when do you let it go? When do you correct? When it's, if, you're, if you're struggling with the balance, you're probably doing it right. That's what I think. Am I too easy? Am I too hard? Uh, you know? And so what we do is we have, every two months, a new parishioner event. Uh, we have one next Saturday night. And we normally get between 20, 30 people at it. And we have a wine and cheese party. And it's a, it's a blast. But what we do with that is we say, at every single weekend mass, every single weekend mass, if you're here and you're looking for a spiritual home, we'd love to connect with you. And uh, drop by the welcome booth, give us your information. And we do that at every single mass. And then we, with that information, we send it out and invite people to this reception. And we're very clear that you are welcome to attend here for the rest of your life. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. But we're, not, we're always going to be inviting you to take the next step. And the next step is, well, think of being in a canoe where you're just sitting there enjoying the scenery and the peop people are rowing the canoe and you're, not, you're just sitting there enjoying yourself. And that's like attending church. But you want to join the parish? We expect you to pick up an oar. You're, you're actually, joining the parish means you're on the team. You pick up an oar, start rowing. What do we expect you to do? We expect you to actually join us on Sundays regularly. People say, I go to church regularly, twice a year. I've been going tw twice a year for 20 years. It's pretty regular. <laughs> but we, want, we invite you to come to church every Sunday. It's the Lord's Day, unless you're sick or traveling, you know. Um, we expect you to connect. This is not Catholics Anonymous. We actually expect you. We have a 
ex expectation that you're not going to hide, that you're going to get connected in somehow. We expect you to serve. Everyone, we expect everyone to serve. It, it, we, you have a gift to contribute to the work of building up the kingdom of God, and we will help you. That we've got 60, 70 ministries we do. It's crazy. We've got to get rid of some. But it's, we will help fit you in. But you have a gift, and we will help you discern that. We expect you to grow. We do, and we, ask, we invite you to start with Alpha. That's really where we ask you. you. You don't have to, but we invite you to start with Alpha, and there's all these other opportunities for growing, and uh, we expect you to give financially. <gasps> <laughs> we expect you to contribute to the work of, 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 the, of the kingdom of God, and we expect your, your, your giving to be conscious, and we'll help you take those steps as well. And if people are like, forget this, that's okay. That's okay. They can, I literally had a lady say to me, Father, we're going to St. Elsewhere's because they don't expect anything of us there. Okay, that, that, I get it. I totally get it. This is, this, is not, this, is not your, this is not your mama's church, you know? Like, this is not what you grew up in. But it's that cultural piece, right? Uh, and you know something? Six years later, we have about this, a slightly... We've got, probably got about a 5-10% increase in church attendance. But I know for a fact, because we measure this, we, we, we use uh, tools by, from, from Gallup, I know that 55 to 60% of my parishioners today were not members of the church when I first arrived. What the heck happened? Well, I had about 60 funerals a year. That's something. <laughs> It adds up, you know, even if half of them were churchgoers in the pew, that's just quite a lot. But a lot of people did leave. A lot of people said, um, nope, I don't like this talk about Jesus. People said that. I don't like all this talk about Jesus. I don't like this talk about evangelization. I am, I am not going to participate in this. I'm saying, you don't have to. I mean, we're not, we're not going to stop talking about it. That's right. That's why I'm leaving. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I don't like, I get very offended when you talk about, about financial giving. Uh, I don't like be, you know, I mean, you know, this idea of serving. I don't like this. The fact that Mass is 10 minutes longer, nope. Um, so people have left and joined other parishes. That's okay. Uh, quite honestly, and it's sad to say, we don't, we don't even really miss them. Because they were, they were dead weight. They were. They were sitting, the, the canoe. It was like two people rowing and 20 people just sitting there complaining not even picking up an oar, like, we, I'm glad they're gone. Like, seriously, in, okay. In one sense, I'm glad they're gone. <laughs> it, it, I'm, I'm, but I'm, I'm not just, I'm, I'm being serious. There's a sadness, a deep sadness, not because they're gone, but because they're walking away from an opportunity to discover. I, I honestly think, I don't think, I don't even really think they understand what the whole thing's about, and they're walking away, and that grieves me deeply. How come we're still at the same level of Sunday attendance? Because half of the people that took their places were people who were not going to church five years ago. Because we're evangelizing. People have, I can look in a Sunday morning, I'm like, one, two, three, two, two, three, three. none of them, they've all had conversions. They were not, it's not like we stole them from other parishes. They weren't going to church. That's half of them. Now, other people have moved into the area because they moved, or, and some people have come from other parishes. And that's not great. We don't celebrate that. That's not a win for us. And I, we never encourage it, but in the end, some parents, for some parents, it is so bad that it's, it's like, they say, Father, before God, I, I've got to, I'm, I want my, parent, my kids to grow in faith, and, and I'm going to lose them if we don't move. I'm not going to encourage it, but I'm not going to stop it. So that, that happens, and God willing, if we form these people, we can send them back. And we're planning to do that next year. We want to send our associate pastor to a neighboring parish and send about 20 families with them with their money and their gifts. Because it's not about our parish becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So with all that being said, with numbers, uh, financially, our collection has more than doubled in six years. We, we used to have ten dollars to $11,000 a weekend. And we're, we're not a rich parish. We're a blue-collar parish. Now we have twenty two dollars to 23000 a weekend. And we spend 99.99% of every, of every cent. And our parish also gives about 150000 a year to St. Vincent de Paul Ministry. Amazing generosity. Um, we have about 50% of our people involved in the discipleship process. We've got four to 500 people in connect groups. We have small group. We've got about 30 to 40, 50 small groups functioning all in homes. 
uh, in ministry. We have a Sunday of attendance, uh, attendance of between 1,500 and 1,600 people. We, we currently right now have, at the last count when I left, 840 individual parishioners serving in ministry in the parish. It's insane. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And, and many people, the impact out there, it's <laughs> clear expectations wedded with high, um, high um, welcome. Strength-based ministry. This is about starting with the person and the gift rather than the needs. In Canada, uh, with, with Sunday school, in my early years as a priest, there was always this thing that said, uh, it was like the week before Sunday school started, we're, we were short for catechists. Father, will you stand up and, and, and get it? So I'm up there basically guilting parents into stepping forward and doing this. And it's like any warm body will do. Uh, and I just grab, let's use someone to fill a gap. Remember, use people, don't use people to build up your church, use your church to build up people. Start with the people, start, don't start with the needs, start with the gift, start with the person. What is your giftedness? What is God doing in your life? What is God saying to you? What passions is God putting into your heart? And let us help you serve. And there are many different tools that we can do this, do, do this with. When this is not done, what happens is people end up being, do, being guilted into doing things because it's their turn, and they end up doing ministry that, that isn't matched to their strength, so they don't do well in it, and they're not happy in it, they're not enjoying it. My very first parish, when I had my first pastoral council meeting, I remember this, I almost chewed, have you ever had to try to stop laughing? I almost chewed a hole in the side of my mouth. And the top of the minutes of pastoral council, the last meeting with the old pastor, was the names of the members, and how much time they had left to serve. It was like two years, two months, and two days. It was, it was like a death, it was like a prison sentence. And after the first meeting, I understood why. Uh, but when you match people to their strengths and allow people to do what they do best and what they're passionate about and do it for God, it's explosive, it's awesome, it's great. Strength-based ministry, small communities. Um, I talked about meaningful community in the sense of, of, of that dynamic of love. But small communities are absolutely essential. Parishes that are actually doing the photocopier thing, uh, they all have small groups. Now, we've chosen to have a system of small groups and, and mid-sized groups working together. It's a bit more complicated, but our mid-sized groups, the focus is community, and small groups, the focus is catechesis and learning. Uh, but if you want your church to grow and be healthy, you've got to do small groups. And again, six years ago, people would have thought this was outrageous. Like, we're Catholics, we don't do this. That's a cult. It sounds like a cult. Now it's normal. Experience of the Holy Spirit. This is one that gets people going. <laughs> I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. You know, like we believe in the Holy Spirit, uh, but... Can I, do you remember when the Holy Spirit, before you got the name change? The Holy Ghost? I remember as a kid thinking, holy ghost, I thought of, remember Casper the friendly ghost? I thought of Casper with a halo, you know, you know, the holy ghost. Like, I couldn't get my head around the holy ghost. What is this thing? And I think for many of us, it's like, you know, we get the father, you know, parent figure and God the father, and, and we get the son, you know, Jesus, you know, God, God in the flesh, God with us. Uh, but the Holy Spirit, I think a lot of Catholics really struggle, don't know. And... And I heard someone say last week, uh, again, someone who had, sorry to keep saying someone who did Alpha, but that's, that's what happens. Like people, it's, it's the best tool that I know. Like people have said, I, I, I honestly did not know anything about the Holy Spirit. I didn't know this, this was possible. Uh, Paul says in Galatians, I think in Romans, no, in Galatians, Galatians, when God's love is poured into our hearts, when God's Spirit speaks to our spirit, we cry out, Abba, Father. God's love is poured into us. The Holy Spirit is God's love being poured into our hearts and our spirit is in, encountering God's spirit and we cry out, Abba, Father. The experience of the Holy Spirit is so key and we have reduced the Holy Spirit to a concept because the person of the Holy Spirit we're afraid of. We're afraid of experience and yet our culture is thirsting for experience. We retreat into the safety of, of, of the doctrine and, and truth. And I'm all about right doctrine and truth. But do you know, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary this week announced that their word for 2016, do you know what it is? Post-truth. Now, post-truth. People don't, people don't, 
research shows that people neither join a church, leave a church, or stay in a church because of doctrine. And that is distressing for people like me, but it's just the way it is. We're in a post-modern culture. And also, people, are, people out there are not suspicious of experience. They're looking for experience. People in here, in the church generally, were suspicious of experiential faith. And when you say, would you like it? People are like, no thanks, not for me. I don't want to be one of those crazy people. Th think of the, the, the focus today on New Age spirituality and, and, and yoga, and people want experience. And this is one of the beautiful things about Alpha. The heart of Alpha is a, a weekend experience, a, a Holy Spirit retreat, where people get a chance to experience the Holy Spirit, and guess what they do? We pray over them after a talk. We just very in a very non-intrusive, gentle way. Um, we don't let any charismatics do it because they, they tend to be like, you know. We say because it's got to be non-intrusive and respectful, and we call on the Holy Spirit, and people have life-changing experiences of the Holy Spirit, and then we bring them back on team. And people who had conversions six months before are now praying over other people, and they're having conversions. It's hilarious. It's like you create a space and step back and call on the Holy Spirit and stuff starts happening. And because God's love is poured into people's hearts and they've got that experience and that experience leads them then to make a decision. We invite them. Would you like to make a decision to give your life to Christ? And people do. And they become missionary disciples. I could tell you so many stories. It's, 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 so, it's so amazing. It really is. It's great stuff. But the experience of the Holy Spirit and so we... We have that at Alpha, we do at our leadership summits. We have three times a year, we gather all of our ministry leaders and their, their uh, associates, the people they're mentoring to take over their ministries. And we do a morning where we focus on vision and, and invest in them as leaders. They are our key vision carriers to their teams. And also, you know, because we've got those 850 people in ministry, right? They're supported by, by um, the ministry leaders and their associate, and, and those people are in turn supported by our parish staff, and most of our parish staff are, are supported by key staff, and those key staff are supported by me. That's how it works. We, we like to talk about bottom-up pyramid rather than I'm people's boss. It's the other way around. Uh, people say, how come you don't say servant leadership? Because there's no, there's no other kind of leadership. That should be a given, that servant leadership. But the experience, what, why am I talking about this? Anyway, sorry. I'm like, I'm so wired right now. Experience of the Holy Spirit. So when we have, oh yeah, the leadership summits. Uh, at the end of it, it's so beautiful. Now because 70% of our ministry leaders have not just done Alpha, they've done Alpha training. Because we move people through Alpha training, we kick them out into the general population. And, and so it's part of the culture. So at the end of these sessions, we just say, grab two people and lay on hands and pray for the Holy Spirit. People do it. Pray for the Holy Spirit. When we have our staff meetings all together, we, we sing and we call on the Holy Spirit. It's very common to walk down the hall and see people laying hands on people and praying over them. We do prayer ministry after every single weekend mass in the chapel, lay people lay, laying hands on people and praying over them. It's amazing. It's great. I like to say, you don't, need, you don't need to wear a Roman collar to say, come Holy Spirit. And you don't need to jump up and down either for the Holy Spirit to come. Because the Holy Spirit wants to come. That's the whole point. Culture of invitation. Culture of invitation. Here's the thing. If you do one to nine, you try to stop people from inviting and they're going to kill you. Okay, because people are, people are going to have the confidence that when they invite their friends who don't go to church or are falling away or don't believe to come to something, that it's going to be a life-giving, positive experience. Our primary invitation point at St. Benedict Parish is not to Sunday Mass for people who are non-church goers or non-believers. It's, it's to Alpha. We're much more secularized in Canada. Canada. We, we've got people who come to our Alpha who have never set foot in church in their life, not even gone to a funeral in a church. It's crazy, but it's great. And so we've got pre-evangelistic things that we do that people can be invited to. We do, we've got a ministry program to uh, divorced and separated people, a ministry program for uh, people who, who suffer from addictions, a ministry program for, for grief support that unchurched people go to. We get breakfast, music things, and that's pre-evangelistic. People are invited, but still the primary goal of invitation is to Alpha. People do invite people to Mass, 
but the primary invitation is to Alpha. And we are very careful to really celebrate invitation and not just the yeses. Remember, if you're going to have a culture of invitation, culture is what you celebrate and what you reward. We have literally done something like this at the end of Alpha. We give an award for who invited the most people. It's like, Jen, come on up. Jen, you believe it? She invited 12 people. No one came, but she invited 12 people. Ah, yeah, it's great. And, and do you see what happens when you do that? Versus saying, come up here, Bob. He invited three people, and all three people came. And people are like, oh, crap. No one came, and I invited them. <laughs> uh, so I'm, forget. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna bother doing that again. Instead of Jen, it's like, like, she invited 12 people, no one came. I can do better than that. I'm inspired, you know, like, but celebrate the invitation, not, not the yes, because it, it's up to God to work in people's hearts. And statistically, for Alpha anyway, for every uh, four invitations, one person will say yes. That's pretty cool. So culture of invitation, and, and uh, we've, we continue to work on this. You, you can't ever st stop talking about this because there's a gravitational pull to make it about ourselves. I said at the beginning tonight, and they probably have finished just our Alpha now at the parish, because it's last night there. We have 200 guests and 43% are unchurched people. People say, how do you get non-church goers to come to your Alpha? It's easy. Help non-church people to have conversions. Who hangs out with people who don't go to church? People who don't go to church. And when they have these experiences, they go and invite their friends and their family. And that's, that's how it happens.